So it is my great privilege to have Pastor Bill Loudermilk come. Would you welcome him, please? And what a great privilege. What a great honor. And I've just been blessed all the time that I've been here so far. This is the first time I've ever been here, Matthew. And I, I'm just looking around and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. I'm just saying, thank you, Lord. You are so good. You are, you are so good. And, uh, you know, I think that I, I thought, of, I, watched, I listened and I watched this worship team up here. And I thought, oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. My goodness. Poised for great things. I, I truly, truly. And uh, I, 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 if I start picking out the one above the other, I, I would do wrong because I thought you were. It was such a, uh, a, a joint effort, such a team effort. And I was blessed, and I am blessed to be here this morning. And, uh, and I was thinking about the name right here on Diamond Mill Road. <laughs> Going to mine some diamonds out here. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about the name, Generational. And what does it say? Psalms 100, uh, to all faithful, to all generations. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen. And Matt Thomas, you're going to be a pastor that's faithful to all generations. Amen. And it's going to be multi-generational. Yes. Amen. Amen. And you know, not only did you, uh, not only did you succeed, not only were you in that uh, upper part of the class when you were uh, a senior in high school, but you know, you just had you were a college student doing well too that that very year, and uh, just preparing for all the things that uh, the Lord had in store for you and for Beth. And I, I am very privileged, very blessed to be here this morning. I hope, uh, I pray that I can do something and say something that will be a blessing to you. I want to. Uh, I brought my own hymn book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you're wondering, now why did Pastor Bill do that? Well, for one thing, I knew this hymn book wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, we actually do have some. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we transitioned from this hymn book to the praise and worship movement under Pastor Matt. He went away to Christ for Nations and what a what a wonderful time in his life. And he brought that 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 new freshness uh, back to where the cross we've never we've never regressed. Although I love the old hymns. <laughs> and occasionally I want to sing one. Amen. And uh, and I've noticed that my son, Bill, who is a, a worship leader, you know, as he's got older, I've no, I've seen you regress a little bit and start singing a few of those too. But not not so much. But uh, I am. Um, I was singing this song very early this morning, very early today, Stephanie. And uh, what I want to do is I want to tell the story this morning. So I love to tell. Was convalescing 
from a very serious illness in 1866, one year after the uh, end of the Civil War. And when she wrote it, she wrote 50 stanzas. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to sing those today. <laughs> About a year later, there was a gentleman who was so impressed by the, by the words. <clears throat> That he, he developed the melody, he, wrote, he composed the melody, and he took about four verses. And it's remained unchanged through the years, but uh, I'm not going to sing all four verses. I, uh, I love to tell the story, more, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story. It did so much for me. And that's just the reason I tell it now to thee. Sing the last verse, Gene. I love. until the time that um, uh, the book of Acts closes. Okay, thank you, Michael. Michael, that was a real bass playing job up there. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm thinking, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> but anyway, I said I wouldn't want to name it. So let me read to you from Acts chapter 9, and I'm just jumping into the middle of the story. Chapter 9, verse 1. Actually, let me read the last couple of verses of chapter 8. Um, let me read the first verse of chapter 8, then jump to the first verse of chapter 9. Now Saul was consenting to his death. That would have been Stephen. And that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. 
And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Havoc of the church. Ripped the church. I mean, he was a house invader. Entering every house. I mean, he was a, uh, a brutal man. Dragging off men and women. Fathers and mothers. And committing them to prison. Now then you have a wonderful episode in chapter 8 of Philip, one of the seven deacons. As you go to chapter 9, it continues with Paul's story. Actually, his name is Saul at this point. He's named after his namesake, uh, he's named after, of course, the first king who was of the tribe of Benjamin. That's where, that's where he, Saul, New Testament Saul, is from. Saul still breathing threats and murder. I mean, he was a terrorist. It, it was a he was a religious extremist. Uh, breathing threats and murder against the disciples, the Lord went to the high priest. And he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. I mean, that was in a complete different uh, province. It wasn't part of Palestine. It wasn't part of Israel at all. But... Um, you know, there were Jewish worshipers there, and so they exercised authority over them. A lot different in those days than, than today. So ask the letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. Damascus was a large city. There was more than one synagogue. Saul intended to stamp out this movement called the way. So that he, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground. You can almost picture him being knocked to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, now other people heard something, but they couldn't understand what was being said. But it was a voice to him, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? And he said, I love this response. And, and don't you imagine it was a very intimidated reply. He, he's startled, he's frightened. I mean, he'd been the one frightening people, but now he says, I would imagine he's stammering. <laughs> who, who are you? Lord, I hear the inflection of a question. And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And it's hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What a question. And the Lord said to him, Arise. Get up from there, go into the city, and you will be told what you must. You, you sense the imperativeness of this? What you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, I guess. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, this lightning flashes, this tremendous crash of uh, heavenly powers. And Saul is laying on the ground, groveling on the ground, and talking, as it were, to someone they can't see, and they hear noises that they can't understand, explain. They knew that something beyond their comprehension was taking place. So the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. He neither ate nor drank. You know, um, I can only imagine his state of mind. I can only imagine the uh, uh, confusion, the apprehension, the startleness of his condition, the fear. Uh, will I ever see again? Have I, I, have I been killing people 
that we're right after all and I'm the one that's wrong? Am I, I, have I transgressed the God of my fathers? Where am I at? What is this? This is part of the story. This is part of the story. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord sent in the vision Ananias. And he said, um, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. <laughs> I guess he probably was. <laughs> and the Lord said, I'm going to straighten him out. <laughs> and the Lord went on to say to Ananias, in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias. In other words, God gave Saul a vision. And he's seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And then Ananias answered, um, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And I, 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 many years ago, I just had a little funny aside to myself. And Lord, is my name is Ananias. That starts with A. But of course, they didn't speak English, so that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> but he did tell me. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And, and Saul did suffer. All the things that he had done to others, he himself had to experience as well. But um, that's just a small little segue into the story. And... Uh, you know, you were telling a little bit about the story. Because the story is not just a story, it's a saga. Mm -hmm. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't start, you know, it started somewhere back here. <laughs> Way back here, somewhere it started. And we have a continuing narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were telling a little bit of the story that brought you to where you're at. And... Uh, as a young, even before I began to be preaching, Matthew, I remember hearing the prayer request at church to pray for your father. Because your father was a local pastor. Your biological dad, your birth father, was a local pastor who was very ill. I didn't know him. I didn't know Gene. I didn't know Harold. I didn't know, you were just a, I don't even know for sure um, I don't think you're, I don't think you were even born when I heard this. I don't think, maybe, maybe you were. Maybe you were a few months, maybe you were a year old, about like maybe your grandbabies, <laughs> 15 months old or so. But I remember praying uh, and not knowing much about who I was praying for, but just praying and asking God to do a miracle. Had no idea. Had no idea of the warp and the weave of the story, how that the story ties together. Had no idea, Todd, your mother was part of that church. Yes. Had no idea that there would come a time, many, many years later, I'd be an old man, and I would stand, and I'd preach, and there'd be Todd sitting in a, in a congregation. I hadn't seen him for a while. Had no idea, because the story is beautiful. The story is all encompassing. Amen. Miracles along. Oh, amazing stories. So I just jumped in to hear with Saul's story or Paul's story because, um, you know, it just seemed like as good a place to start as any other. How that God can just, as the young lady was talking about, God doesn't need to be invited in. He can, be, he can interrupt our lives anytime he chooses. Amen. There is a great advantage to inviting him to, but God is God. And he always will be God. Yeah. And Saul thought he was doing something right. And God said, no, you're doing wrong. 
and I'm going to take care of it. We'll straighten that out. Wonderful story, wonderful story. Um, and uh, the story is, and it has been since the very beginning, God's going to have a people. Amen. God's going to have a church. God's going to have a church. He's going to build that church. Yes. He's going to build it on the rock. Yes. Rock of his own revelation. Mm -hmm. Not anybody else's rock. Right. He's going to build his church on his rock, on his foundation. Oh, yeah. And I am so blessed. Mm -hmm. And you are so blessed. We are so blessed to be part of that story. Part of the chapter. Now, in my own life, in my own life, you know, so I, I've always loved to read. I've always, I, I've always loved to Adventure stories, always loved a good story. And many times I, I, I look toward the end to see how it is. Because I really like the story where the guy got the girl. You know? <laughs> and you know, you can look at the end of the story and you can rejoice. You can, it doesn't take anything away from the story. It only makes the story sweeter to you. And so, I just want to tell you, I see nothing I see nothing but victory on the horizon of this church. Thank you, Lord. I see nothing but empowerment. I see nothing but a great harvest. Amen. I see nothing yes. but advancement for the kingdom of God. Amen. I see nothing but great exploits. Yes. So I want you to lift your hands and praise Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. So, Do it, Lord. So, Do it. I'm thinking about Paul and how his name was changed to Paul and and uh, you know his that's really that's really when Paul entered the story. Now you think he's introduced to the story here in chapter nine, uh, but not so much. He, he he's somewhat introduced to the story, but he had, he's still in the wings. He's still a bit player at this point. You know he's been big in the eyes of his contemporaries, but now he's at the bottom of the of the uh, anarchy or the pecking list, the pecking order. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, yeah, he, he starts telling everybody that this is the, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is being persecuted as the Messiah. But really, if you're, uh, if you're studying, if you look close at the story, you'll know that there are 13 or 14, about 14 years have passed before what God, what Jesus tells Ananias, he said, I'm, I'm going to show him what I'm going to do, I'm going to send him to the Gentiles. Actually, about 14 years passed from the time that he has his Damascus Road experience to the time that God releases him. And the Holy Spirit says, separate to me Paul and Barnabas over yes. chapter 13 for yes. the work that I've called him to do. So, so this is not really his entry into the story. This is his uh, understudy for the story. Yes. He really enters the story in chapter 13, where in the course of that missionary journey, when he started that journey, it was Barnabas and Saul. Uh, but somewhere on that journey, it became Paul and Barnabas. And what happened? He went down and up at the same time. Because his name's Saul, and he tells us his pedigree in chapter uh, uh, two of chapter three of Philippians, where he says, "I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was a tribe of the tribe of Benjamin. Touching the law, I was blameless." Um, you know, and he says all these things about himself that he thought were true, but his real story. It's found in 1 Timothy when he says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. In chapter 13, his name, just in one sentence, is changed from Saul, from Saul the Hebrew form, in one sentence, no explanation, no explanation. Uh, you know, he, Saul meant, you know, the implication was he was an heir to a great throne. He was of the lineage of Saul, the first king. But in one heartbeat, or one syllable, his name was changed to Paul, mm -hmm. which means little guy, <laughs> little person, mm -hmm. little person. 
And at the same time, which with the symbolism of that is that all of a sudden, Paul understands it's not about being great in the kingdom of God. It's about being a servant yes. in the kingdom of God. And his name was changed from that of the great king to just a little guy. That's all it meant. It even, wasn't even a, really wasn't even a personal name. It just meant little guy, little man. And, and of course, uh, church history tells us that Paul was diminutive, diminutive in, in stature and that he really wasn't all that good looking, probably a little balding and a little, he had some eye visions perhaps, eye trouble perhaps. But, and somebody said, said, he's not even a great preacher. You read that over in Corinthians. He's not even a great preacher. And so when, when Paul came to the end of himself in the story, that's when God promoted him in the story. And no longer is it Barnabas and Paul, but it's Paul and Barnabas. Paul had written one of the 13 epistles that he's credited for writing in the book of uh, in the New Testament at that time. He, those were all in front of him. So his story is just one small episode, just one small chapter. Yes. Not even a chapter. <clears throat> really, not even a chapter in the, in the largeness of the story. The story that spans from there to there, from east to west, oh, it's the greatest story that's ever told. Amen. And you know, you know, I just use him as an entry point. But actually, all through the Bible, there are people who are part of the story. And uh, I just, you know, I've been preaching out of the book of Acts. Perhaps you can tell that, Matthew. You know, I, I love the book of Acts. I love to preach out of the book of Acts. I've been preaching out of it since, uh, since uh, Easter. But uh, I, I wrote some things down for myself this morning just that I wanted to uh, uh, mention. Um, to you today, I, I thought about the different players in the story. And I'm going somewhere with this, so just give me a minute if you would, please. I'm going to take much of your time. But uh, as you start reading early on in the, in the history of the New Testament, in Luke Acts, you read about Mary. You know, that only Luke, only Luke the historian tells Mary's story, really. Mm -hmm. And you remember how she's confronted with the angel and it's a, it's a breathtaking thing that the angel is suggesting. I mean, it, it, it requires, hey, listen, everything was on the line for Mary at that moment. You remember her response? Mm -hmm. Be it unto me according to your word. And so I'm just thinking of all the different characters and players that stepped into this great drama, this great story. There's Peter. Now, you would think that Peter, Peter was in the story in the Gospels. Really not so much. In the Gospels, you know, you, you have Peter who opens mouth and inserts foot, you know. I mean, <laughs> he's, he's there, but you, you, you don't see how God can do much with him. And, and he tells Jesus, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. And, and you, can you think of the shame of Peter? When I think of Peter, I think of a man who experienced the depth of shame, mm -hmm. and yet God allowed him to recover himself from the shame yes. that was in his life. There may be, you know, I've known people in my life who had great shame in their past, and, and sometimes that shame was almost more than what they could bear. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about my mother. My mother had a hard life. My mother's father, my mother's father was an alcoholic and she was the oldest of uh, uh, she was the oldest girl of six six sisters and two brothers she had one brother older than her but she was the one that when her mother passed away when she was just young that the burden of the family wow. fell on her wow. they lived in, in uh, various places many places because my grandfather was a traveling man uh, he couldn't keep a job because he imbibed and so he would move from one profession, one place to another. And in the transition period, many times he left his house or he left his children in the care of whoever he could leave them with, splitting them up and up sometimes and other times, just leaving them there in a rented home with my mother to take care of and protect. 
I just got a little glimpse into my mother's story because I could tell much of it was painful to her. She had much things that, that shamed her. She had things that weighed heavy on her mind. But when mom came to Jesus, hallelujah. When mom came to the Lord, the Lord just wiped the shame away. And he took her past. He took her past where she had been denied a mother's touch, a mother's guidance, or a father's wisdom, a father's leadership. He took her past. And he used it for the glory of God. And that's what God did for Saul, Amen. who he transformed to Paul. And in my time, my short little chapter, my short the few lines in the story, I've known people that had shame to bear. It weighed heavy on them. But aren't you glad Amen. that God can use yes. his church? Hallelujah. And God Hallelujah. will use his church to lift shame Amen. off of people. So there was Peter. Amen. He was part of the story. But oh, he failed in the gospel. Do you remember the account? We're just in, in, the, in uh, uh, contrast to the fact that he denied Jesus three times. Jesus said, do you love me? And Peter couldn't say, he couldn't use the word for love that Jesus used because it was, a, it was a love that he knew nothing about. He just said, well, Lord, I like you. He was afraid. He was ashamed. He was ashamed to use the word for love that Jesus was inviting him to use in three times. And so, you know, it has to get over into the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes. And all of a sudden, in chapter 2, Peter's standing up. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit can get into your life? and can help you stand above all the defeats of your past, above the shame that the sin Amen. has tried to assign to you. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what it did for Thank my mother. Lord. My mother never knew a person that she felt better than. My mother never looked down on anybody in her life. I can't say that I've been that great, really. There's been some times God had to correct me, Matthew. <laughs> But my mother, I can honestly say, my mother, it, when, my, when mom and dad started the church, Gene, just a, a couple of years before you and Arnold started the church, Truth Tabernacle, when mom and dad started the church, she was like, a lot like you, Ben. She was really in, in, you know, associated with her husband and wanted to do the work. And uh, there, was, there was never a little kid, there was never an older person. Didn't matter what your ethnic background was. Didn't matter what your race was. Didn't matter, Mom. Uh, Mom, uh, you know, we started off with not too many assets. A lot. Of, I mean, I'm going to tell you, you have a wonderful place here, Matthew. I, this is a gift from this. God has just dropped it down on you. Praise God. But I don't know anybody who deserves it more. I don't know anybody who deserves it more. But anyway, starting out with you know, some really store buildings and so on, and um, I can remember an old Volkswagen van. I'm with you, can remember what it looked like a, a hippie van, you know? <laughs> and it was a stick shift, and some a lot of times you had to roll it to jump start it. My mother would get that van, and she'd drive that van, and she'd go all over town, and she'd pick up, and she couldn't get many adults to live in drive that van, so she picked up kids. And you know what? One of those kids. One of those kids is our children's pastor to this day. Yes. And she, you wanted me to say something about outreach to the community? Yes. Much of it, most of it really rests on her vision. So I just want to tell you that Almighty God in this story is inviting you and I, invite every one of us to be part of it. And the things that Satan meant for our harm and our hurt, Jesus. God yep. is able to make for our good. Why don't we give the Lord a praise? I pray for some Peter, some some man or some woman who has the same story of Peter. Mm, I pray yes. that those who've experienced shame in their life, mm. that in this house, yes. hallelujah, will rise to the stature Do it, Lord. of being one of those people yes. that uh, God uses yes. to reveal the next chapter in yes. yes. his story. Amen. 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 And then there are so many of them. Think about Stephen. Oh, God, give some Stephens in this congregation. Yes, Lord. Give some Stephens that love you so much that if necessary, they would give their life. Yes. Lord, not so much that they have to die, but that they can live for you, Lord. When yes. no abandonment, Lord, can give it all to you. Give some Stephens.
see even to this house. Yeah. But what about some Phillips? What about some Phillips who just start out serving breakfast, you know? It's just their job to put donuts and coffee together in the morning. You know, just one of the seven. It's just their job to pass out food at the pantry door. But yet, when the time comes, when the, when the heat was on, and when the persecution was abounding, Philip went down to Samaria, a place where no good Jewish man would ever go. Unthinkable that he would cross that boundary. Unthinkable that he would go to that extent. And there he preached Christ to them. And there was great joy in that city. Can't you believe that there could be some Philips here at Generational Church? I believe it. Amen. I need to be a Philip sitting here this morning. You know, when I look at Philip, I see an example of someone who just obeys what God tells them to do. Yeah. Amen. Yes. When I look at Peter, I just look at somebody who stands up in spite of their defeat, in spite of their shame, in spite of what the devil tricked them into, they stand up and they receive the grace of God to be fitted into the household of God. Yes. Well, there could be some Stevens, there could be some Phillips, there could be, uh, you know, when I think about, when I think about Paul, when I think about him, read his story to I thought about, there's a sinner if I ever saw one. Come on. Come on. There's a sinner if I ever saw one. Man, you think of all the terrible things. This isn't, this isn't, you know, just a, a figment of our imagination. I'm telling you, this Saul was a bad guy. That's right. He was a bad guy. I remember the, listen, my dad, the first church my dad ever pastored was a little church, little church building up in Greenville, Ohio, and I was only about 12 years old, 11 years old when he went there to pastor, and there was a lady that attended our church, a very small church, very small church, starting with dad, dad, with God's blessing, dad was able to build a congregation, but there was a, there was a lady that attended our church, her name was Edith. Edith come and she got saved, got wonderfully saved. But her drunken husband, who was a violent man, was so angry over that that one day we were in church, he, he put padlocks on the outside of the doors to keep us from getting out at the church. And somebody had to go out the window to try to unlock those doors. And, and I remember that. I remember the day that he came to my, our house. We lived in Greenville. And I was only about 12 years old. And he called my dad out of the house. And my dad walked out of the porch realizing that this man was angry. And he said to my dad, he swapped my dad. My, my dad walked down on the sidewalk to take him away from our house so that we wouldn't be a party. But I followed him out. And I heard that man threaten my dad and tell him he was going to stomp him into the pavement and drag him up and down that street. And he was a big man physically able to do that. And I remember my dad, who was much smaller in stature than I am. You know, I took after my mother's side. He, dad was shorter than me. He's like my brother. I remember my dad, instead of re responding with anger and venom, my dad laid his hand on him and began to pray. Mm -hmm. And that man, I remember that man dropping his head and stepping down off the curb so he would no longer be taller than my dad. And he bowed his head and he, without a word, he turned and he left. A short time after that. Now, they said this was the meanest man in Greenville, Ohio. That's what was said of him. People told my dad, he is the meanest man in this city. And so, a short time after that, I don't know, I'm just telling stories, Matthew, because it's a great story. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> a short time after that, we went to, uh, and I'm going to get done. I'm going I'm to be mindful of your time. You're fine, Matthew. A short time after that, we went to a, an all-church conference that we went to every year, part of the group that we were in at that time. And uh, before we had left, my dad had started to build had started to build an addition onto the church. You got to realize this was a little basement church. Oh, it was a strange little building. Uh, when we first went there, you know, you 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 you've been in sanctuaries where the floor is inclined and so easy to walk down the aisle to the front of the church. Well, this, the building that was inclined there, but it was the other way around. You had to run uphill to get to the altar there. But somebody had poured concrete in that little building and didn't know how to pour concrete. And somebody, this is long before the time of building codes and things like that. You know, you just, you just, you just build it, you know. So my dad was building an addition onto it. He had a block laid up about halfway around on this addition he was building. He'd done that himself. 
And while we were gone, kids in the neighborhood knocked all the blocks down. But before we came home, somebody had laid the blocks back out there. Concreted them, cemented them, and, put them, and plumbed them up with plumb line, laid them up straight, put them up right. And the neighbor said, the meanest man in Greenville did that every day. Wow. You see, when Thank God you, picks in the story, he can change a man. Amen. He can change a man. He can cause a man to be made new. You can be the, you can have, you have the meanest man around. I want to tell you something. It's, you know, I know we have, we live in a world that is that's split apart by religious dissension. Yes. You know? Yes. But I'm going to tell you, we're never going to win that war. Right with a strong arm of flesh. Right. Right. We're never, we're, we have to have a military, and I respect our military. I am prior service. I'm prior military. I respect our military. But our military are not going to win this war. Right. It's not possible for them to win this war. If I turn myself I think it's just gone out. So okay. You're, you're fine. Okay. Doctor, <laughs> Sorry about that. But we can win this war by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And what... Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the worst terrorist that ever lived, the most mean terrorist that ever lived, Come on. wouldn't it be a great thing yes. if Jesus just struck him yes. with a bolt of light? Whoa! Hallelujah! <laughs> if Jesus just struck him, because he, he may think what he's doing is pleasing to God. Come on. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if all of a sudden there's a crash of lightning? Uh, and and uh, he's laying there, he's, I can't see. And he says, who are you? I'm Jesus over your persecution. Well, I tell you, God is able to change evil men's lives. <laughs> yes, he is. You've known some, I've known some. Yes. <laughs> and anyway, yes. well, there's so many actors, so many players in this story, so many participants. Uh, I'll just name two more, and I'll do it quickly. Uh, Ananias, Ananias. Now think about that. Think about it. See, if Peter to me represents the man who overcame shame, mm. and uh, Paul represents to me a sinner that was changed into a saint, if Philip represents to me uh, just a, a waiter who just put out the coffee and the donuts, and yet he became the one who mm. brought the bread of life. Yes. If, when I think about Ananias, I'm thinking about somebody who just simply believed. And God used his faith. He was just who he was. He was just available. Yes. God said, Ananias, what did he say? He said, Ananias, verse 10. Ananias. I mean, he doesn't say he said it three times. This is Ananias. And he said, here I am. Lord. And I believe that God can raise up in this congregation, Come in this on. church, Matthew, yes. people that will simply be available. Amen. People will simply say, Pastor Matt, here I am. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? There actually are three Ananias in the New Testament, and they're all in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Now, the first one, you don't want to be anything like that. That's in chapter 5. You know the story. There was, a, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and they loved money, and they loved what people thought about them more than they did what God thought about them. We don't want no Ananias like that. <laughs> and then there's another Ananias in chapter 23, I believe it is. I believe it's chapter 23. And he was a high priest. And Paul had been unjustly accused and unjustly treated, and they tried to kill him and God has spared him, and, and now they had him in front of the Sanhedrin, and, and they said, all right, give an account for yourself. And he, this is the first thing he says, I've tried to keep a good conscience before God all of these years. And the high priest said, slap him in the face. Mm -hmm. And they backed him and Paul in your face. And Paul said, you white, what is white, what? You whitewashed sepulcher, God will smite you. And then Paul said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> they said, are you going to revile the high priest? He said, well, I didn't know he was a high priest. <laughs> he probably did. He probably did. He just didn't want to admit it. Or maybe he thought he's not acting like a high priest. 
See, three Ananias in the New Testament. I want to be the one that's available. I want to be the one that doesn't set in judgment on others Amen. falsely or loves the finances of this world more than I love God's favor. I want to be one of those Ananiases that are available Amen. when God speaks. Amen. I believe there's going to be some Ananiases in this congregation. Yes, Lord. There are going to be some Ananiases. There's going to be some Phillips. There's going to be some Stevens. There's going to be some Stevens. There's going to be some, there's going to be some Apostle Peters. There's going to be... Amen. You know, there's going to be some Johns. You know, when you see Peter, you usually see John. You know, you, you know that when Peter followed Jesus afar off, John was there close. Because the, the Gospel of John teaches us that when they got to the house of the high priest, where they had taken Jesus into the courtyard, mm -hmm. that John was a relative mm -hmm. of that family. And John, they, they opened the door. Whoever was keeping the door, keeping the gate, they opened the door for John. And Peter went in with him. And uh, later, you have the cross, the crucifixion. All the disciples fled, right? John was there. John was there. You, you might ask, well, why did Jesus remand the care of his mother into the hands of John? If Jesus, Jesus had he had four brothers, but they weren't there. They didn't believe in, in him until after the resurrection. Jesus had sisters, but they were not one of the women that was there. They didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. When I look at John, I look at somebody that can be trusted. Come on. Amen. You know, yes. Jesus said, I'm putting my mother in your care. Come on. Yes. I love her. I love all of you, but I love my mother. And she's in a savage world. And I'm putting her in your care. Because you see, John, I trust you. And you know, I believe there's going to be some Johns in this congregation. People that you can trust, Pastor. People that will, you'll be able to remand into their care that which you love, that which you hold dear. Amen. Amen. I feel that. I sense that. Amen. I sense that. What a, what a, I see nothing but increase Thank you, Lord. for the future. Yes. I see nothing. I say that next week in your keynote service, you know, your opening service, your grand opening, I just, the glory of God is going to come down in the house. Yes, sure, Lord. Amen.